Welcome to the Dashboard Effect Podcast. I'm Rick Thompson. And I'm Landon Oaks. Hey, Landon. Today, I wanted to talk about uh, AI and data a bit. Um, I've been seeing studies, reading various things that are interesting about the number of failures of AI projects. Obviously, all the AI tools are getting better fast. We use them a lot in development and in other parts of our business. The LLMs for producing content can be super helpful problem solving, um, even debugging SQL, debugging DAX, all those things are great. Um, but we're hearing about a lot of failures in enterprises around AI. For example, Gartner is saying that uh, over 60% of AI projects will be canceled uh, in 2026, current projects. And MIT came out with a study back in August or a paper um, where they said something like 95% of AI projects are failing. And if you look into those and, and try to figure out why they're failing, it seems to come back to data foundation often, more than half the time projects are failing because there's not a good data foundation for these to build on. And so I thought we could talk just a few minutes about what that means. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot, at least in, you know, from the high level for where, I'm, where my brain goes initially, there's there's a lot that goes into a data foundation. You know, it's uh, not a simple thing, but I mean, a good way to think about it, like a lot of the companies, you know, that we see, they have tons of different systems all over the place. Uh, their data is split between them. Sometimes they have the same data in both, but slightly different in each. Um, and sometimes you can't even get to that data, right? So that's like problem number one. Is it's actually getting access. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. taking all of your different silos and getting them together. Something like, I read a stat, something like 87% of enterprises that are putting data together for AI are using data lake houses. That's our mm -hmm. primary um, uh, architecture these days, most, most people. Um, there are cases still where you're doing a Kimball style, Kimball Group uh, style data warehouse for certain uh, applications, that's the right thing. But in the f most most of the time now, we can use data lake houses and build semantic layers on top of them. So that makes it easier in some ways to consolidate the data. You can get the data together um, and then start building semantic models on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I mentioned semantic models. I thought we'd take a minute and talk about what a semantic model is. Um, sometimes people will think that data model and semantic model are interchangeable. In some ways they are, but in some ways they're subtly different. I'm not sure that matters so much, but um, maybe you can describe, you know, why you need to build a semantic model and what it does for you. Yeah, definitely. The, uh, the way I like to think about a semantic model is, you know, it needs to be so simple that just anybody can look at it and know. What, what's in there, right? And what is it? So just let's start even more basic. So yeah. what, what does a semantic model do for you sitting on top of a data lake? Yeah, it, it essentially gives you an area where you can point the most traditional is reports. Um, you know, it works well for reports. It stores your logic, your metrics, your business logic. Um, and it really tries to distill down your data as, as simple as possible um, to allow these tools to actually work well. I think of it. of it almost like the translation layer. So you got all this data, mm -hmm. even structured data, uh, sitting inside of a data lake, but you need to give a business analyst or a report writer or uh, an AI system a way to query that data that's sitting in the data lake, often in a bunch of Parquet files, so that you get what you expect out, so that you've you've applied sort of standard column names to things. Yeah. And as you said, you've defined your measures and your metrics and your KPIs in there uh, and so on. That's that's a whole discussion there around how to do that. But yeah. but it's basically this, uh, the interface so that, that you can pull the data that you want to get out of the data lake, yeah. lake house um, consistently and, and, and correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, with a good semantic model, you know, there's usually a big difference between if you're looking at the data in the model versus looking at the data on the lake house yeah you know and what i mean is like there's um a lot of times you'll have a bunch of like different address fields for instance sometimes the address will be in two different systems and the names will be kind of garbage um that all gets cleaned up so now you see address one address two zip code state right like something that people can easily tell what it is yeah and that that's the biggest benefit you get out of those models 
And in fact, if you build it well, uh, people using it don't even need to know what the data source was. Exactly. They just know the data they're looking for and, and sort of behind the scenes, uh, if you've done a good job with your modeling, um, it's making the, the connections between systems that it needs to to give you good answers. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, we've built, we've talked about it uh, briefly on a couple of our podcasts, but we've built a tool internally to do natural language querying against a data lake house. And um, it gives our engineers a way to <clears throat> just type a question in, um, mm -hmm. looking for some data. And this tool, we call it Celeste, uh, will actually go out and um, query the data, look at the semantic model. Um, infer things about the structure if we've built it well, which which we do. Mm -hmm. um, we can give it metadata about the structure as well, and then it will return a SQL query, basically just a serverless SQL query that will give you the data that you're looking for. So you don't actually have to construct that query. It can build a quite a complex query to get yeah. that for you. So that's the start of natural language querying. Um, one of the reasons we do it that way, just as an aside, uh, rather than have it go out and run the query, is we don't want to uh, necessarily put uh, data into the LLMs, even mm -hmm. though they're protected. We're still being quite cautious about that. But we can get the query from the LLM and then go execute that with a, with a client of our choice that we know is secure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so the semantic model enables that. Yeah, it does. And it, it's, you know it's very different to the results you're going to see if you're not using the semantic model, right? Like we've tried it on just the data that we just grabbed from the source and put it in the lake. Um, some sources are really nice named and very well laid out. Some, but that that's actually few and far between. Most sources yeah. you find are not going to be that way. And it struggles when you point it at that data. But when you point it at the data we've modeled, we, we generally get back really good, really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that that brings me to another idea around how do you build a, a good data foundation? And that's just governance around the data. Um, governance, uh, you can you can get into the weeds on governance, like what's involved there. Um, you know, the main things that I think about when I think of governance is uh, having good provenance on your data. You know where it came from. You know it can be trusted. Um, you You have specific transforms that are done. Those are cataloged somewhere and have been approved and you don't change them without, you know, getting whoever the allowed approver is to do that. Mm -hmm. um, when you've defined uh, measures and metrics, there's a very specific process to define uh, what is it going to tell you, what are the fields we need from what systems, what is the SQL calculation, what is the DAX calculation, who's the approver that gets to sign off that it's correct. Um, what are some of the uh, error modes that you might see in pulling that and identify those so that you can have the system look for those? How are you handling security? Who's allowed to see the result? Role-level security or um, those types of things. And those become really important when you start exposing this data if you're going to let uh, an AI system do natural language query and actually look at the data and pull data back for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. It becomes important. Uh, I had the experience... Uh, last week of asking ChatGPT to connect to our HubSpot instance and go pull some data for me. I wasn't so worried about the security of that. It's our data um, and it's sales pipeline data, so maybe not the most uh, most sensitive data. And it went and did all kinds of interesting calculations and came back with uh, answers to my questions and I went and checked it. it was actually correct. You have to have really good governance to know that's going to be good. Mm -hmm, um, exactly. So, that's a big part of it as well. So you've got to not just pull the data from the silos, um, not just create a good semantic model, but have all of the scaffolding around it to make sure that the data is good. You've done good error checking. You, you've defined what falsifies data, like a record with a null in this certain field is no longer uh, reliable, you know, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to that. And when you're going over that list, you know, it's governance. Is, there's, a, there's a lot there. Um, and you know, a lot of times, like including myself as a developer, it kind of makes my eyes roll a little bit like, oh, that's not the fun part of the job, <laughs> no. right? But it's Documentation critical. as yeah. a developer, yeah. It's not fun. I don't yeah. enjoy it, but it's critical. You know, you got to do it. I've seen, I've seen cases where people have tons of different developers. They kind of just let them build whatever they want in there. Right. And it's confusing. I don't, you don't know where to go to get things. You don't know what's being used. It's, it's slows you down a lot as a developer. And so AI will be, you know kind of in the same vein Even worse, it'll, yeah. it'll be worse yeah well yeah it's uh, maybe worse because the user doesn't know what to ask the ai to get 
So if you've defined, if you have a catalog of measures and you have a catalog of synonyms you can use to ask for certain things, um, you have a much higher chance of getting the answer that you wanted yeah. as opposed to just hoping the AI figures it out. I'm sure the, the tool, these tools will get better and better mm -hmm. and better. Every tool is improving. I mean, almost weekly, if not monthly right now. Yeah. Um, but we've got to give ourselves the best chance we can f to get good results now. And and certainly, as I think about it, using AI in business, there's sort of this, uh, you can almost think of a graph where you have this y-axis AI correctness and on the x-axis, importance of something being correct to the business. Do you have a higher risk thing on the x-axis and you have a lower correctness on the um, y-axis, you know, you've really got to think about how you control that and how much people need to be involved. We're all trying to get to where we can have sort of high correctness and and we've taken the risk out, uh, mm -hmm. but we're a long way from having that dialed. And so these types of things that we're talking about today are what protect you in this in-between period and really knowing sort of, all right, we've got the good foundation and how far can we trust it and, and so on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The uh, uh, incorrect too, you know, can can burn you with buy-in, right? If if you get burnt by this tool once, you're you're gonna have a hard time trusting it. So, so it's buy-in and adoption. But there's also, I mean, if you're making important business decisions, yeah, yeah. you need to know uh, how much can you trust this. Mm -hmm, exactly. So. All right. Well, I guess that was all I really wanted to talk about today. Uh, it's good catching up, and talk to you next time. Yeah. Thank you. All right.